nice to see everybody. So if you want to ask any questions, there is also down at the bottom something that says chat. If you haven't used this before, you can click chat and type in a, a question. And if you want to ask a question because um, your hands are sticky and you don't want to type something down or you want to just quickly ask something, the easiest way to do that is to press your space bar and ask your question and then release it when you've finished talking and then it automatically goes back to mute again if you're using a computer. All right, let's get cooking. What's the first thing, Doc? So what you would want to do is put your self-raising flour into one bowl and then you will put your sugar in <gasps> We've forgotten to tell them something. What's the first thing they've got to do before we even start? Turn your oven on. <laughs> Turn your oven on. So before we do anything, I know I put it in the messages, but just in case anybody didn't get around to doing that, um, go and get a grown up if you're not comfortable doing it yourself, but set your oven to 180 degrees. And then it's ready by the time you've made your cake mix, okay? All right, so you're going ahead and putting in your sugar. Caster sugar. How much caster sugar went in, Dot? 150 grams. 150 grams. And then you can get a whisk and just whisk it through. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stand here and have a coffee by the way while she, while she does her thing. <laughs> And then once you're sure and you can't see any more sugar and it's all mixed through, you get your sieve, trusty sieve, and then you get your cocoa powder, your two. Nice reading. I've done it in decimals, haven't I? So we've written the recipe next to us just in case um, anybody needed to have a quick reminder or didn't have the recipe to hand on their phone. Um, I've written 2.5, which is what in Old English? Two and a half, isn't it? Two and a half tablespoons of cocoa powder. Now, at the end of the class, um, we are going to, ooh, we've got one more person who's just joining now, so we might have to catch them up. Dot, look who's here. We've got another friend. Cassidy. Yay! <laughs> and another one. We're just admitting Ruby as well. So everybody can say hi to Ruby and Cassidy. Hi, Julia. Hi, everybody. Hello. So, uh, quick catch up. Um, everybody's come in. Um, muted and with their video off but if you want to put your video on we'd love to see you um and we've got everybody muted for the most part so that um we don't have to listen to everybody's kitchen class you only get to hear dorothy's kitchen. laura laura i have a quick question yeah I realized i have been running out of oil can i also take rough seed oil Rapeseed oil, absolutely. So anything that's light and not too strong in flavour. So rapeseed oil, vegetable oil, um, uh, sunflower oil. You could even use, um, if you've got canola oil, same, same kind of thing if you're in the US. Um, all of those things are good. Great, thank you. Awesome. In a pinch, you could even use melted butter if you wanted to go that way too. Yeah, these days we've got to make, make do with what, whatever we've got. Yeah, so if anybody's got questions, feel free to go down to the bottom and click chat and type in your question in the sidebar. But if you've got sticky hands or you want to just jump in and ask something quick, the easiest way to do that if you've got a computer is hit the space bar um, and then ask your question and then release the space bar at the end of talking. Okay, my grandmother would say, oh, don't say that. You're teaching people to suck eggs, Laura which sounds like a horrible idea. I don't know why anyone would want to suck eggs, but you know what I mean. I hope that's not patronising, but there's always somebody who's not used it before. So Dot's just going to give you a quick catch up on where we are so far. So what have you got in the bowl so far, Dot? Um, we have flour, your self-raising flour, put it in a bowl, and then get your caster sugar, 
and pour it into a bowl. Don't worry about sieving those things. Um, and then get your, um, and then once you've got those both in the bowl, you will mix it around with your trusty whisk. And then you will sieve your cocoa powder um, into the bowl. And into, your, into the rest of your dry ingredients. Now, lovely Ruby said, oh, sorry I was a bit late, I put the wrong one in. I, I think I put the two and a half tablespoons, not the 40 grams. You did it perfectly, Ruby, that's absolutely right. Your 40 grams of cocoa is gonna be used for your icing. Don't worry at all. <laughs> you did it spot on. So in the bowl now, we've got our 175 grams of self-raising flour, our two and a half tablespoons of cocoa powder, one teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda, and 150 grams of caster sugar. And Dot is using her little chefy trick, which is to use a whisk to mix it together. These days, you rarely need to sieve anything, but we had a moment the other day where we had some cocoa, some beautiful cocoa from Italy, and the cocoa was very, very well packed. And so we put it through the sieve just to make sure it didn't have any really big lumps. That's um, mostly with all cocoa though. Oh, do you think? Yeah, sometimes that's true because pure cocoa tends not to have anything in it to stop it from packing together like that. It doesn't tend to have a desiccant. I can't hear that. So yeah, there we go. You, hi, um, could you just very slowly go through the ingredients again? Sure. Um, so it's the, yeah, no. the easiest thing to do is to have the Instagram page open on your phone and then you've got your list of ingredients and the whole recipe's there to check back against if you didn't measure it out before class. But otherwise, it's 175 grams of self-raising flour, two and a half tablespoons of cocoa, one teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda and 150 grams of caster sugar. And the full recipe with everything on it, including the method, I will put up at the end of the class. Um, and so once you've uh, whisked, whisked, or whisked is a brilliant word. <laughs> That's exactly what they should call it. <laughs> Once you've whisked it all around, you'll get your bicarb uh, your isn't it supposed to be baking powder? Not this time. Your bicarbonate of <laughs> soda and you will sieve it yeah. again. Again, you don't always need to do that, but if you're anxious about it or it feels like it's a bit clumped up, it's never a bad thing to do. But if you don't have a sieve, a whisk is a really nice, easy way to, to do that. It fundamentally does the same thing. It breaks it all up and moves all the different ingredients together and aerates them and breaks up any lumps or bumps that you might have in there. And so what we're really doing is making sure that all of the dry ingredients are in one big bowl which will be your main mixing bowl for the end batter. Or, as we've done, we've taken the bowl that actually connects to the KitchenAid, which is the mixer that we're going to be using to blend it all together at the end. If you don't have a stand mixer, it doesn't matter at all. A handheld mixer works absolutely fine. Just make sure you've got a nice big bowl so that it doesn't splatter everywhere and you don't end up wearing your cake rather than putting it in the tin. Um, but you can also, the joy of this cake is that not only can you put it in any tin, you can also do it by hand. Oh yes, glamorous assistant. Or am I the glamorous assistant? Who's the glamorous assistant? <laughs> She's just showing you the tin. Ooh, we've got another person checking in. Um. Hello. Hello, Aga. Nice to see you. 
Og is just joining us now. Nice to see you. If you'd like to put your video on, feel free to do so. Otherwise, hang out and we're not offended if you stay with your name up. Um, feel free to ask any questions. So far, Dot has mixed together all of the dry ingredients. So she's put her flour, her cocoa, oh Ruby, thanks so much, that's great, putting that in the chat. Flour, cocoa, bicarbonate of soda, and the caster sugar has all gone into her main mixing And bowl. don't forget to sip all of it. Not the flour or the caster sugar, you can take that out, but maybe, probably sift the cocoa powder and bicarbonate of soda. Anybody have any questions? We put in the 2.5, uh, sorry, we put in the 40 grams of cocoa powder by accident instead of the Oh, you did, you did it, you did do it the wrong way around. Yeah. So, I think I'm not too worried. You're going to get a very dark, um, you're going to get a very dark cake that feels rather more gross than everybody else. I don't think it's dark. Um, I just joined, so how much, so what do we have to do first? Have you measured out all your ingredients first? Yeah. Brilliant. So take the mixing bowl that goes to the sand mixer and all of your dry ingredients. Your sugar, your cocoa and your base bicarbonate exposure. All right. So should we gently move on to the wet ingredients? Yeah. Shall I take those bits and pieces out of your way, so you start? Yes, please. There we go. So you can brush your whisk and put it to the side so that you can use it with the wet ingredients. And the first thing you're going to do is crack your eggs and beat your eggs. And you can use the whisk to do that, or you can just use a fork. And Dot's going to show you her clever way of, of breaking eggs. Look at that one, show them. Can you see everybody? It's got feathers on it. It's got feathers on it. It came from an actual real life chicken. Well, of course it did. What else would it come from? <laughs> well, sometimes it's hard to know, isn't it? Because they all come out so shiny and perfect. Sometimes it's easy to forget that it hasn't actually come from an animal. <laughs> so maybe take the feathers off if you've got feathers on your eggs. <laughs> yeah, feathers they in tend, cakes isn't so good. <laughs> they tend to not be so good in cakes. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And we've even got we've even got a, a bit of straw. And we've got a couple of people on this call who've actually got chickens in their garden and might even be making their cake today with eggs from chickens. <laughs> We're not so lucky, but they're pretty nice eggs anyway. Well, I guess it's because we're in the city and we've got very protected dog that barks at every single thing he sees and hears. <laughs> and, and would eat chickens. It's yes. True. All right, how are you going to crack your eggs? Hey, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe don't do that quite so hard. I'm trying to get you another one. <laughs> she did prove a, a point though, which is that the magic trick is that if you've got two eggs, the easiest way to crack them really easily, she showed you, is to tap them together. And if you tap two eggs together, only one egg will ever break. Um, and it's a really nice way to. Um, to do it without sort of cracking it on the side of the bowl. When you crack it on the side of the bowl, you, that's when you often find that you end up with a bit of shell that drops in. It usually drops from the side of the egg and into the bowl. Um, 
Oh, she's been so good. She's just gone and fished out all the shells. Do you think it's all right, actually? Because it doesn't matter if the egg's broken up, as long as there's no shell in there. Yeah? Do you want me to have a look? Yeah. Give me one second, I'll just check. I think. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah, there's no shell in there at all. Yeah. Okay, let's go back. We're probably getting caught. I, I think you're right. Here we go. Yeah. Staring at our useful oven. Staring at our useful oven is maybe there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, egg number one. And then, of course, egg number two, you haven't got a, another egg to crack it again. So, unless. Well, unless you get another egg, that's true. Um, but so you can either crack it against a glass if you're worried about getting more shell into the bowl that you've already got an egg in, which is often a good way of doing it because otherwise you then have to fish around in there. And in the last class that Doc did, we spent a bit of time trying to fish out some eggshell. Cracking eggs is a talent. You can do it on the, on the um, flat part, sometimes it's easier. Oh, you've got it. Well done, just dig your finger right in. There you go. Fantastic. And if you do it in a separate glass before you add it into the egg that you've already done, um, it's quite a nice way of making sure. And if you, and again, a clear glass is a really good thing to do it in because you can hold it up to the light or, or as Doc just did, duck down and have a quick look in the glass and make sure that there isn't any shell in there. If you have a cake that maybe needs, like if you're making a brownie, for instance, and it's got six eggs, um, the thing that's really annoying is if you, you crack the first one, crack the second one, crack the third one, and then the fourth egg that you put in, you manage to crack it and it gets loads of shell, and then you've got to fish around trying to get the shell out. And you? if you've got snails in your garden, I would keep your eggshells because apparently eggshells, snails really do not like eggshells. They don't. Why don't they like eggshells? Because it's smelly. Smelly and it's really uncomfortable to slide over. So yes, if you've got a snail problem in your garden like we do, we keep all our eggshells and scrunch them up into little tiny pieces and then sprinkle them around our herbs and things that the snails really love. And it doesn't keep them away completely, but it definitely is a good deterrent. And then you'll pour in your milk or your oil or your something. Well, any of your liquid ingredients, right? Although I would mix your eggs around first. Very good idea. So take a fork or a whisk and mix up your egg to break it up so that you don't have the whole yolks floating around in the whites anymore. They're a nice pale mix. Extra. Ah, you have a very late comer. How's it look? You want to show them how it looks? Well, the joy of doing it in glass, we try to do as many things as possible um, in the teaching kitchen in glass so that you can see through it. Um, but if you need a close-up, just, just holler, press the space bar and jump in and ask for a close-up. So, no. so far we've just got our, our egg, don't we, in the, in the wet bowl. So then, mm -hmm. you can put your 150 milligrams <laughs> your 150 ml of semi-skimmed milk into your very special beaten eggs. So Dot wasn't wrong just then when she said 150 milligrams. So actually um, liquids like water and milk, almost exactly you can measure in grams and in milliliters. Um, it comes out the almost exact same. So she's now adding her milk to her eggs. Oh, that's very nice to see. It looks like hollandaise, but very runny. <laughs> it's a pretty colour. It's definitely the same colour as hollandaise. They were lovely eggs, weren't they? Yes. Yeah, they were blue leg barn eggs, those ones. Blue leg barn eggs, but okay. <laughs> uh, so next? the oil goes in next, or any ingredient that goes in next goes in next. 
What do you mean any ingredient that goes in next goes in next? It's the oil that goes in next, right? So you mean any doing well it would matter if you put a flower in, wouldn't it? But the flowers will get yeah. yeah, she has a point. She's see this one. But yes, fundamentally any Sorry. ingredient can go in. Just uh, ask how much oil that was, because that looked like a lot of oil compared to what we've got here. It was 150 millilitres. Is that okay, brilliant? Was? Thank you. It's yeah. just because it's in quite a big thing. And it's being held by a very little hand, so it might look like a lot more. <laughs> so you should have 150 mils of sunflower oil, or vegetable oil, or rapeseed oil, or canola oil. oil. Yeah, the only one I think that I would try and avoid, unless you're really desperate, is olive oil, just because it's got, um, especially a cold pressed extra virgin, has quite a lot of flavour to it, which in something like um, a specifically an olive oil cake or an orange cake um, is delicious, but in something like this, not so much. Now, you don't need to mix your eggs and stuff as good as that, but you can. That's pretty good, it's very well mixed. And then you'll put in your syrup, golden something, something, something. Golden syrup. Yeah. And if you haven't got golden syrup, is there anything else that they might be able to use, do you think? Mm. What else is sort of runny and sticky like that? Honey. Yeah, honey would work a treat. And normal syrup. Yeah, any kind of... Um, Sweet. Any kind of sweet syrup. Golden syrup is really good because it's got that really thick, unctuous texture. Um, but in, in a pinch, you could even use potentially maple syrup um, or even agave um, or a really thick, simple syrup um, or runny honey works really well. But golden syrup is the best. So if you've got that, go ahead and use that. All right. So now. So yeah, Ruby's just asked a little question that. Um, did you add the milk and the oil? So yes, so in here, we've now got all of the wet ingredients from the cake mix. So we've got the eggs, the milk, the oil, and the golden syrup, all mixed together. Does everybody feel like they've got that done now? It's tricky, isn't it? Because we don't want to go too fast for people, but we don't want to leave anybody behind either, eh? All right. So, what? Laura. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, hi, hi, Dot. Um, did we miss what the oven should be set at? You did. You did. Oh, okay. Because I just put it on 180, thinking that I might be. Oh, on. Uh, okay. Thank you. So what do we do next? You mix it as I was just doing, and then you will pour it, uh, actually first, put, make a little hole in the middle of your dry ingredients. Yeah, do you want to use a spoon to make a little bit of a, so there's a technical term sometimes that they say in, in recipes, which is make a well, um, which often kids go, what do you mean make a well? It's well, a volcano. It kind of looks more like a volcano. She's absolutely right. So I would um, always show people that that's when it says in a recipe, make a well, that's what it means. It means make a kind of big dimple, um, almost like a bowl in the middle of your dry ingredients. Should we show them? Yeah? So you've got a nice kind of hole in the middle of your dry ingredients that's then ready to take your wet ingredients. And now if you don't have a stand mixer or, a, or an electric hand mixer, you absolutely can make this cake by hand. So it's also a really nice one, you know, if you ever go camping, um, believe it or not, you can make this on the fire. Um, and, or if you're staying in self-catering cottage or something where they don't have equipment, this is a really lovely Sunday afternoon, rainy day. Anyone else got a day like we have? Rainy day cake that you really can make completely by hand. So, but we're not going to, are we? Because we're a bit flat. <laughs> so now, we shall take this to the mixer. Which is right behind you. You get it? Oh, yeah, you can. 
Yeah. Alright, and then we're going to use um, what's referred to as a K whip or a K beater, which looks like this. You can use the whisk attachment, um, but we're going to hold on to our whisk attachment because we're going to use that for our frosting. Can you get it on? So we just start it on low speed so that it doesn't splash up everywhere. So you start it on a low speed, and then when it starts to come together, you can turn it up a little bit. Have a look in. So you can turn it up just a little bit, and then I think that's it. We don't want to overbeat it, because the more you beat it, the top of the um, gluten in the flour tightens up, and wants to fight back. And in some things that we bake, that's something we want to encourage, but in a cake, we don't. Um, now, if you can see in here, the joy of having a glass bowl means that you can see all of the mixture. Is there some mixture? Is there some mixture at the bottom? In which case, we're gonna take a spoon and just make sure that all of the bits that are stuck to the bottom are captured because otherwise when you pour your mixture into your cake tin, you'll suddenly get a blob of flour or a clump of something dry that you don't want to come across. So you want to make sure that all of your mixture is nicely combined. And all, don't worry because I, I often, um, talk to students who go, oh, I hate my KitchenAid because it always has this bit stuck at the bottom. It's not KitchenAid, it's not Kenwood, it's not Maginix, it's all of them. It's a centrifugal force and almost always you'll end up with a little bit that's stuck at the bottom. So, so don't worry, it's not, um, it's not a defect of your machine. So if it's a little bit lumpy, scrape the lumps off onto, yes, you've definitely got a good spot. You've got a lump of flour there. So then scrape it onto the side of the, the beater and we'll go again just for a few more seconds to make sure that it's all combined well. There you go. Hey! You might even turn that up good and fast just for a moment. Good. Why don't you bring a piece of paper towel over as well, sweetheart, so that we can make sure that the beef doesn't drip everywhere. So is everybody thinking that they've got their mixture nice and combined? No lumps and bumps? Because lumps and bumps usually have a little tiny bit. Depending on how big they are, they probably have a bit of bit of flour, a chunk of flour or something, which isn't going to be nice when you bite into your cake later. Yeah. So that is Dot's mix. I don't know if you can see that quite well. It's got a little bit of bubble to it. It's nice and aerated. It's really smooth. It's quite pourable. It's like the sort of consistency of thick paint, I'd say. So if anyone's doing it by hand, keep going until you've got that consistency. Now, next up is our tins. Now this recipe we call Dot Any Tin Cake because you really can use this in any tin that you have, which again these days is brilliant because not all of us have any tin. the perfect 18 centimetre tin, which by the way this is not. So this particular recipe originated as a BBC Good Food recipe which calls for two 18 centimetre tins. Well, these days, nobody wants to go out unless they absolutely have to, and they certainly don't want to go to a supermarket um, or wait for days and days just to get an 18 centimetre perfect tin in order to cook a nice cake in. This cake recipe can go in anything. You can make it as, uh, what different ways did we think about that you could, you could make this? What do you think about me? Oh, sorry. I thought we thought about cupcakes you could do it as. No? Cupcakes and cakes as well. Yeah. Sorry, if we did cupcakes, how many cupcakes do you think it would make? I think this would make 
um, 12 cupcakes, I reckon. Um, and then so the only difference is going to be the times that you bake it for. So you could do this as a tray bake and cut it into squares if you only had a kind of deep dish oven tray or even a shallow one. And then you could um, turn them into little square sandwich cakes. Um, could be really fun. Um, or you could cookie cut, if you made them in a tray, you could cookie cut the cakes out and sandwich them together with the frosting. Could be really fun. You could do, apparently I thought about this on my own, but obviously wasn't with me. I clearly had a conversation with myself. <laughs> Um, we could do muffins, we could do, he did, he did a terrible treat. Get his hands out, let's say. Show them, show them a close up. This is frosting we made earlier. Actually, not we, who made it? Me. Yeah, frosting Dot made earlier. Not earlier, a few days ago. Yeah, a couple of days ago, the last time we made this cake, right? Um, but so you could do, um, in fact, what we, the plan today was to do one single round cake, wasn't it? And then whatever we've got left, do as, as little loaf cakes, because we've got this rather cute loaf tin that we haven't used for a while, and they're quite fun. Um, we... Yeah, question? Oh, sorry. Um, we've got two 20 centimetre tins, so should we use both of them, or just one? I reckon if you want to do a really nice big um, kind of birthday cake style cake, maybe just go for one. How tall is it? It's it's like this. Oh, sorry. It's like this. Let's see, let's see. Is it the depth of the height of your hand? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that'll be fine. And what will happen is if come up, as long as it doesn't fill to more than three quarters of your tin, you'll be absolutely fine. Um, so if it fills to more than three quarters of your tin, then maybe put the excess in um, little cupcake cases. Um, but I think that would be really nice in, in one big cake. And then when it comes out and it's cooled, you can slice that in half. And it, it puffs up quite a lot, this cake. And sometimes that's really nice. You can leave it nice and domed or you can slice the top off, nibble on that while it's cooling, um, and then have a flat top to put the rest of your frosting on. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, should I put this in the microwave? It's just a bit so we're not gonna put it in the microwave and we're not gonna to need to use that until quite a bit later, are we? But that's, that's just one that you made earlier, isn't it? So that you can show them what the frosting looks like at the end. Yeah, now Ruby, whose frosting um, will have slightly less um, cocoa in it, but obviously you can add that frosting, that cocoa sweet up. So your two and a half tablespoons, a tablespoon of cocoa comes out to about, probably be about 10 grams. So if you double the amount of your two and a half tablespoons for your frosting, it should come out to roughly 40 grams. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Brilliant. And then you're just going to have a rather darker chocolate that's um, a, a little bit more decadent and grown up and not so sweet. That's no bad thing. Um, might be even better. Let me know. All right. So what we're going to do is fill our round cake tin now. We're going to fill it to just over halfway. You're going to get on and do that dart? Or do you need help? Because it's quite heavy, that glass bowl, isn't it? I'll hold the glass ball and you can squish it in. So I think we'll probably get maybe two or three of the little loaf cases. Yeah, that's plenty, isn't it? Yeah, do you want to just use the spoon to wipe away the drip there, not your finger? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so there's our cake. That's just over half full. And then let's see if we can do this without getting it all over the papers. That's not. Oh, I think we want it just more than half. Yeah, we should go together to the next one. Good teamwork. Look at us. So this one might be um, a little bit lower, but that's okay. Because that'll be a nice chef treat. Yeah. Think we can get any one. more? I don't think we'll get any more, John. There won't be enough to fill a whole one, will there? 
So I think let's just make these two really lovely and, and full and luxurious. Yeah. Just for the two of us. Just for the two of us, yeah, let's not tell the boys. <laughs> two loaf cakes. Oh, and then we were going to do something to the middles too, weren't we? Do you remember? We were going... We're going to put holes when they're baked in the middle and we're going to fill them with Smarties. I thought we were going to make a cake. We are making cake. There's your cake there. Did you want to fill the cake with Smarties as well? No, I thought, no, I, I didn't think it was going to be this. Ah, well, we don't have to do it to this. Yeah. But that is fun, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you think? Should we do that or not? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah. Or, or, or fill it with chocolate buttons. But obviously when the cake is cold, not hot. <laughs> All right. Is this thin enough? Let's have a look. Who's that? Who's that asking that question? It's Nina. Hey, Nina. Let's see if I can see you. Where are you gone? There you go. No, um, I'd, no I'd fill that more than that, sweetheart. So if you put your muffin case into the muffin tin so that the tin is holding it, you might find that a little bit easier. And then you want to fill it until it's at least half, maybe two thirds for each cupcake case. And then I'm sorry, sweetheart, you had a question over here, which, which number on the kitchen age we put it on. Um, so it doesn't matter. We started it out on number one or number two as we got going. Um, and then I zipped it up to about number four or five just to make sure that it had broken up all the lumps. But your batter looks lovely and smooth, so I'm not worried. Can I do something? What? What did you want to do? <laughs> uh oh. What How long should we put the cupcakes in for? So. Oh, she's doing a reaction. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's tell them about what the different timings are and things, yeah? So. A big cake, if you're going to do one big cake, which I know one person is doing, that. that for about 15 minutes. No, that's going to take a little bit longer than that, actually. That's going to take between 25 and 30 minutes. But don't panic, because I'm going to tell you exactly how you're going to know that it's done. Okay, so a cake about this size, this is a 16 centimetre tin, and it's just over half full. That cake is going to take approximately 20 minutes. A single solid cake that's bigger is going to take 25 to 30 minutes. Little cupcakes, the smallest ones, are going to take about 12 minutes at 180. And then these loaf cakes like this is going to take dots sort of 15 minutes. But don't panic, because if you've got anything close to the size of what we have here, you can just check it. So it's done when it's done. And the way to know that it's done is because you can get a grown up, to push the top of the cake and the cake is going to feel really lovely and firm and bouncy to the touch. You can also take a skewer, a metal one or a wooden one, and poke it right down the very centre of the cake. And if you pull it out and it doesn't have anything stuck to it, then you know that it's completely cooked all the way through. But to double check, you can give it a push on the top and it will be firm and bouncy to the touch. And it's going to puff right up. Um, and be really lovely and domed. So that's it. We're, we're pretty much, we're, that's, that is how easy that cake is. Unless you would like to see us put it in the oven and take it out of the oven <laughs> and put that in the oven and then take it out of the no, oven and, they really and then make the icing. <laughs> <laughs> they really don't need to start us doing that. But so what we're going to do is we're going to pop the cakes in the oven now. They're at 180. And so what I'm going to do is I'm even going to put both of these, even though they're completely different sizes, they're going to go in at the same time. I'm just going to take the smaller ones out sooner. So I'm going to set an alarm for 12 minutes and then I'm going to check my little loaf, loaf cakes. Right, let's get these in. And then the next thing that I'm going to do is put up the full recipe for you so that you guys can make the frosting which takes a few minutes in the 
um, in the mixer and that's very boring to watch and you're all more than capable of doing that I'm sure. So do you want to just talk them through the ingredients Dot? Um. Yeah? The ingredients. You're too busy eating your frosting aren't you? Mm -hmm. Icing sugar. Icing sugar. 225 grams of icing sugar. We should not be sipping it. No, no, it's fine. It's fine because the whisk goes around so fast. And honestly, these days, I work with the most amazing pastry chef who worked for Jason Atherton for years, and she says, you just don't need to sift anything anymore these days. Um, but occasionally, as we learned with Coco the other day, that, that is not always the case. And now the butter. Mm -hmm. Ozzy's a bit melted. Which is fine, and the recipe that I'm going to send through um, actually says for you to soften the butter first before you add the icing sugar. But we don't need to do that. Don't worry, we'll get milk in a moment. We don't need to do that because our butter is so soft. And then that is what our 40 grams of, of cocoa looks like. Okay? So. Our recipe that I will send through to you now um, says to do it in stages. Did anybody spot the dog? Um, <laughs> says to do it in stages, but actually it's fine to put it all in one go. But again, the one thing that I would definitely advise is that you start it off very, very slow. Otherwise, you get this amazing cloud of cocoa and icing sugar that will fill your kitchen and drive your parents mad. So try not to do that. The other trick you can do is lay a kitchen um, tea towel over the top of your um, your mixer just to make sure that it doesn't just fly everywhere and so what I'm going to do now is add a file to the chat and you will be able to access the full recipe. Now we've had one message saying, privately saying, please can Dot do it so we can see, um, which is absolutely fine. So as long as people don't mind that it's just noisy and a bit boring to watch, you can absolutely do it. Do you want to go ahead and do it, Dot? Sure. Yeah? Oh, Sam, you're putting the icing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's very bad for you. Definitely, if it's got anything chocolate involved. I think it was just a bit nice and sure. So did anybody have any questions? Um, are we adding all the milk in? So no. So the milk, as Dot said, where's the milk? You don't have the milk until the very last, okay? So it's only um, two and a half tablespoons of milk. So what you're going to do is make sure that you've got your butter and your sugar and your cocoa really well mixed together and then you're going to have the mixer go for a while because you're going to whip in lots of air to make it lovely and frothy and light and fluffy. Um, I don't know if any of you have been to Hummingbird Bakery but this recipe for frosting is fundamentally based on their um, frosting recipe. He's the most wonderful guy. Um, what attachment should we use for our KitchenAid? Not any of my <laughs> That one. The whisk, the, whisk, the whisk attachment. Does anyone like to see the dog? Mm. Yes! No. Oh, someone does care about the dog. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can look at the dog while I have... Oh! <laughs> We have a foot in the icing. Oh. <laughs> Just while we're making another batch. Oh. 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 There we go. All right, Doc. Do you want to? Do you want to keep an eye on this so it's on number two? Please, can you? Um... Sorry, sweetheart. Was there a question? You just answered it for me. Oh, good. Okay. So we're on number two at the moment. So we start at number one, then move to number two, and then we're going to whack it right up, all the way to the top, when we feel sure that it's not just going to fly everywhere. And then we're going to very slowly add in the, um, the milk. So I'm going to grab that from the fridge now. Dot, you're in shock. Yeah, do you see how Dot's laying a tea towel over the top just to make sure it doesn't fly everywhere? And 
And then because I'm a chef, I'm not using a tablespoon measurement. I'm just going to put two, two and a half tablespoons straight into here. There we go. <laughs> so how's it looking, Doc? <laughs> You're going to take the tea towel out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Should we show them what that looks like? Sure. Yeah. So it kind of looks like sand at the moment. Do you see that? It's all sort of grainy, but it's definitely come together now in a way that isn't going to fly up in big clouds. So now what we're going to do is give it a blast on highest setting. Have you added the butter yet? Sorry, sweetheart? Do you add the Butter, the cocoa, and the icing sugar, and then after exactly. Butter, cocoa, and icing sugar all together in the pot. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, should we get that done? We should be okay now. Should I'm getting a little go anywhere now? So I've taken that to number six actually. I think that's enough. And then I'm going to put in a tablespoon at a time of the milk. We're just going to pour in approximately one tablespoon. Oh, she's bigger than the sound of the sugar on the splash of the Perfect amount. And you'll notice that it's very quickly turns to a paste. It's just stuck in the lemonade. Yeah, it's dark in the lemonade the other day, but remember, it will get tender as you put it. Yeah. I think we might not need it anymore. So you, you might not need. so much that you separate the, effectively the curds and the whey from the milk product um, but you have to go some way to do that um, so when we're making um, in a commercial kitchen if I make this in a Hobart um, and we do 10 20 30 times this volume we'll have that going for I mean sometimes for half an hour you can have one of those machines going for and it's it's fine um, and unless you put in too much milk um, so that you've got a wet mix You'll be you'll be fine. Um, but so I can show you exactly what ours looks like now. There we go. Now, did anybody have cupcakes that went in? Because you probably have. Yes, we did. Yeah. You might just have a quick bit and place them in now for seven or eight minutes. So if you've got a glass oven, you could have a peek. Try not to open the oven too much to let the heat out, but that's what ours now looks like. Okay, and then again, because it's a KitchenAid and often bits get captured on the bottom, 
make sure that you take a silicon spoon um, or similar to gather up the bits that might have got caught right at the bottom. Laura? <laughs> yes, lovely. Uh, when should I add my milk? Should I just, um, just, uh, I've basically, I've got all of the cocoa powder and icing sugar right. and butter mixed up, so should I add the milk now? So does it look really grainy? Um. Or does it still look very powdery? Uh, it looks very grainy, so. Great, so if you feel like it's grainy enough that it's not just going to fly up in a big cloud, you can go ahead and add one, maybe, maybe half of, of the milk. That you've got okay. and see how that goes um, and yeah it may well be so we've used almost all of ours so I reckon I've got a tablespoon not quite a tablespoon left of, of the milk um, but there was definitely a, a good two tablespoons that went in there okay oh that looks so good can I taste it um, this doesn't look very much like buttercream, it looks very like grainy, is that right, before you add the milk? Exactly, so before you add the milk it will look really grainy, almost like wet sand, Thank you. sticky sand, and then once you add the magic ingredient milk, it'll all, it'll all come together and suddenly turn into this beautiful velvety um, frosting. Yay, thumbs up. Love it. Should we have a look and see how ours are doing? Um, um, Laura? Yeah? Our cupcakes look like they're crackling on the top, but all yeah. good in the middle. Don't worry. Like they're, not ready. they're nowhere near ready, so they'll puff up and crack um, on the top. They're going to rise up and be nice and domed. And if you don't want them to stay domed, you can just cut the dome off and eat that, and then cover it with frosting. Or, or cut a hole in it and fill it with Smarties or anything. Okay, so we're gonna have a quick look at ours. Sugar. Woo! <laughs> Shall we show them? Yeah. So these are our loaf cakes. They're not quite as firm as I want them. So when I'm pressing them, the dimple is still staying down, but they're lovely and domed up. Can you see? So I'm just going to pop those in for just a couple more minutes. All right, that's about it. And then when they come out of the oven, can you put the frosting straight on it, Dot? Now stand here so they can see you, sweetheart. <laughs> You're having too much fun using the frosting, right? <laughs> um, no, you cannot. You have to wait till the cake or muffin or cupcake or whatever you have is cool. <laughs> uh, and then you put it on. Otherwise, all the icing will just melt and it won't be. It'll slide off. So you have to be patient. But that's one of the reasons why this is such a great recipe as well, because if you can't bear to wait another moment to have a bite of it, it's fine because you can cut, wait for it to cool a little bit in the tin. And then if it's cool enough to touch, then it's fine to take it out of the tin and put it on a rack to cool completely. And at that point, you can cut, if you take a sharp bread knife and get a grown up to help if you're not confident, take a sharp knife and cut straight across the top if you want to have a flat cake. And that dome is your gift from Dot. And you can eat that um, while you wait for the rest of the cake to cool enough for you to put the frosting on. Yeah? And then what we would love is to see all the creations that you guys make. So, so and so does the dog, yes. <laughs> um, and so we're, we're gonna leave you with that, I think, and, and let you crack on. Now, Dot um, is doing these classes at the moment because she wants to raise awareness with me, her mummy, for a couple of really amazing projects, don't we? Um, one of which is called Cook 19. Cook 19. Which, uh, for your help, we have gotten something. Oh. 
<laughs> yeah, we've, we're incredibly proud. Um, we've managed to connect quite a few people um, to this extraordinary project and with your help as well, the donations to Cook19 have meant that yesterday they served their 20,000th meal um, to key workers, which include those who stack shelves, those who work for the NHS, people who post our letters, people who clean our streets and who might be stuck at home um, and don't have access to the amazing ingredients that I know all of our families are very lucky to have access to. So we're very proud to support that project. So if you're on Instagram or your mummy or daddy are on Instagram, do tell them to go and have a look at that. It's um, called Cook19 and um, it is very much supported and worked at by very good friends of ours, isn't it? Uh, and mass. Massimo Baturas one. That's right, and Massimo Baturas project, which is here in London, which is called Repertorio Felix. And whilst he is not getting food to key workers, he is making sure that all of the people who relied on his service before Corona hit um, are still managing to get a hold of a hot meal, three courses every single day and Repertorio Felix is the name of, of that charity, which is part of the Felix project, which takes otherwise unwanted or unusable fruits and vegetables and meats from supermarkets and redistributes them to kitchens that then turn them into beautiful, wholesome um, food filled with love that can be served um, in beautiful environments, particularly Repertorio Felix, which is actually a church, and they all sit down together and eat a three course meal with a linen napkin. Um, and that is available to people who are homeless um, all over London. So please do donate or go and check out the work that they do and see if that's something that you're interested in. And if you want to know more, please go ahead and, and send me a little message and I'll, I'll let you know. Um, but thank you so much for tuning in. Good luck with your cakes. Let us know how they turned out. Thank you, thanks. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.